Rick. Oh, yes, that was uh, Psalm 66, 1 through 4. Yet the scripture verses you read this morning where Christ is coming yes. here to us. You know, unable to come to God, he comes to us. Yeah. Even the enemies, you will come to me. Yeah. Rick's point, point, so uh, the live stream picks it up, is that Psalm 66 is saying that uh, so great is his awesome deeds and his power, so great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. And, um, you know, so we think uh, of David, uh, all the enemies, Moab, Ammon, Philistia, they come to him. They recognize the superior power. That is so much more true, and that, that is Rick's point that this then is really fulfilled in Christ, and it's fulfilled principally post-resurrection, where we see his power. And uh, Paul takes this up in Galatians, that he leads captivity captive, that he defeats his enemies through the power of the gospel. And that's really quite an amazing thing. I mean, and finally, it will happen again on the final day when he judges the wicked who refuse to submit to his reign but first and foremost, we see that the enemies of the Lord submit to him in faith and repentance. And, so, and that's why I chose this was verse 4. All the earth worships you, and you see that this is fulfilled in Christ. So we, you cannot read the Bible correctly and understand it apart from the cross and the empty tomb. Crucifixion and resurrection are the lens through which you must read in the beginning God created to the last verse in Revelation 22. And that will enable you to understand because the whole story points to this climactic moment when the Son of God dies and rises. It's all about him. And then it, it uh, we are caught up in that story. So good point, Rick. Um, any other questions? All right, we're going to turn our attention to the Belgic Confession. Um, and actually one little point, Rick, Rick uh, not Rick, um, Ray and I were just talking briefly before, uh, during the fellowship time, and just talking about this and, and thinking, you know, the disciples knew that he was the Christ. Peter acknowledged that you are the Christ. So they all knew it. They all believed it. But they, they struggled to know what this meant, and, and they couldn't understand the cross until they saw the empty tomb. And then they understood he was a king coming to save the world to not just save Israel, but to save all nations. But anyways, so they knew this, they assented to it. He was the king, he was the Messiah, and that faith of theirs received all the support it needed on, the, on Palm Sunday, triumphal entry. They had the earth reverberating with the echo of the hosannas, the donkey, the Messiah, their Lord riding, the palm branches, the Pharisees gritting their teeth. They had it all, and it was just reinforced in their minds. He is the Christ. And if you have that in your minds, you'll realize why the cross on Passover morning, uh, Good Friday morning, was so catastrophic to their faith. They already knew he was the Messiah, but now the whole world acknowledged it. And when he dies, it is an utter defeat for them. And they have no way that that fits in their theology, in their worldview. And, and so really, what happened on Sunday morning was just, you know, it was just, it just brought everything together. And they're like, yes, this is it. And that, it's like the penultimate before the ultimate crash. And, uh, but resurrection will turn the tables. And they're just going to soar to 30,000 feet at that moment. Just boom. It's like, he's the king. Like we never thought. Like we never knew. So it will be really glorious. But Lord willing, you can make it to Good Friday service. We look forward to meditating on the cross of Jesus. And in God's good providence, these things are not timed by me, but we do we do come to a study on the atonement this morning, which I think is very helpful. So turn in your Psalter hymnals. We'll read the Belgic first. 
to page 862, the atonement, article 21, page 862, You see Guido de Bray who writes this really kind of teases this out because already Article 20, he just was speaking about the fact that God is both just and merciful and these things are not in tension but they're in perfect harmony and they are resolved in Christ. And now we're going to talk about the atonement in verse 20, uh, Article 22, we're going to speak about righteousness of faith, how we possess it. Article 23, justification. Again, ask yourself, why is he spending so much time on this? Well, he's writing against Rome, remember? Rome had lost the gospel. So he's really spending time to say, hey, do you understand the gospel? This is what we Protestants believe. Article 21, the atonement. We believe that Jesus Christ is a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, made such by an oath, and that he presented himself in our name before his Father to appease his wrath with full satisfaction by offering himself on the tree of the cross and pouring out his precious blood for the cleansing of our sins, as the prophets had predicted. For it is written that the chastisement of our peace was placed on the Son of God, and that we are healed by his wounds. He was led to death as a lamb. He was numbered among sinners and condemned as a criminal by Pontius Pilate, though Pilate had declared that he was innocent. So he paid back what he had not stolen. And he suffered the just for the unjust in both his body and his soul in such a way that when he sensed the horrible punishment required by our, by our sins, his sweat became like big drops of blood falling on the ground. He cried, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And he endured all this for the forgiveness of our sins. Therefore, we rightly say with Paul that we know nothing but Jesus and him crucified. We consider all things as dung for the excellence of the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We find all comforts in his wounds and have no need to seek or invent any other means to reconcile ourselves with God than this one and only sacrifice once made, which renders believers perfect forever. This is also why the angel of God called him Jesus, that is, Savior, because he would save his people from their sins. You can see how, without mentioning Rome, it's a full frontal attack on Rome. <clears throat> uh, it says we, we have no need to seek or invent any other means. No prayers to saints, no indulgences, no reliance upon the Virgin Mary, no reliance upon our good works, no other means by which, uh, by his sacrifice, he renders believers perfect forever. Let's turn in our Bibles to Isaiah 53. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 53. This is one text that the Jews... They didn't know what to do with this passage. They didn't know how to fit it into the, the matrix of the Psalm 2, Messiah, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. How does it fit? Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, 
like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. But he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah wrote that a little bit before Israel would be deported to Babylon. kind of atrocities that we hear going on in Ukraine is what they experienced at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar's men. All because they had abandoned the Lord. They had been rebellious and wicked. For they could be chained and drugged and prodded all the way to Babylon knowing that he bore their iniquities. God would chasten them severely, but they would know that Christ the Messiah bore the punishment. Let's talk about the atonement this morning. This is the core of who we are as Christians. This is our identity. I want to introduce it, and I don't have blanks to fill in, so I apologize for that, but we do have questions that you can be writing. What is the gospel? Think about that. <clears throat> How would you define it? Define it in your own mind. Think of an answer if I were to ask you. What is the gospel? I have seen in my ministry that, shockingly, many Christians cannot answer this question. And it is the most basic, fundamental question. They will answer in terms of the effect of the gospel, the result of the gospel. It gives peace. It's the foundation of my life. But I prod, what is the gospel? A three-year-old should be able to answer this question. It could be something as simple as this. This is the gospel. Jesus died on the cross for sinners. If I believe in Jesus, my sins are paid for. That's simple. That's the gospel. Gospel is good news. It's a report of an event. Here's the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's the gospel. If I ask you what is the gospel and all you can do is recite John 3.16, I will give you five stars. That's awesome. That's the gospel. Here's the gospel, a little bit more meaty. The gospel is the good news of how God has provided atonement for sinners in the death of his son on a cross. Good news that God has provided atonement for sinners in the death of his son on a cross. We could flesh that out a little bit more. It is the good news that Jesus Christ has saved us from our sins by his death. That there is a forgiveness that is granted through the death of Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. For I ask you this question, parents, make sure your children can tell you the gospel. Parents, make sure you can tell the gospel to your children. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus is God's son. He paid for all our sins. 
if you believe in him, he's paid for your sins too, and you will be forgiven. Keep it simple and embrace it. We're talking about the atonement. Let's look at the next question. What is atonement? So add some meat to it. Here's the question. What happened at the cross? Now, this is very, very important. What does it mean to atone? Atone means to remove an offense. What offense is the cross removing? The offense of sin. Sin is our want of conformity to the righteousness of God. It's our want of conformity to the law of God. It's our deformity. So the Hebrew word that is translated to atone means to cleanse from sin. It means to cleanse from the defilement or the pollution of sin, most often by sacrifice. It can be translated to propitiate, to pacify, to expiate, to cover, to appease. And you'll see here in your bulletin that we're going to look at these features of the atonement. It's propitiatory. It's expiatory. It's substitutionary. These are big words, but remember, big words are tools. And it's important that we know what the atonement is, that we don't have some quasi lukewarm Christian light that says, well, Jesus loves me and I love Jesus and we're going to be okay. No, this is the event for which the Son of God took on flesh. It is important. This is the critical moment in the Son of God's life when the Father cursed him. This is important. This is the event by which we are saved. It is of critical importance. Let's understand the gospel. This is why Jesus shed his blood, and this is why Christians have shed their blood for 2,000 years since, because we believe in the gospel. At the cross, Jesus provided atonement. He removed an offense, the offense of sin. So if we misdiagnose the offense that we have committed against God, we're going to misdiagnose the meaning of the cross and the purpose of the cross, right? This is, this is what happens in Christian liberalism. This is what happens <clears throat> uh, by people who don't understand the gospel. If we've only learned bad habits from a heart that's basically good, we just had some bad influences in our life, we have some baggage, then the cross is just an example of selflessness. The cross is just a demonstration of how much God loves us. The cross is just something to encourage you to be a little bit more generous to others and not so proud and obnoxious. We don't want to misdiagnose the problem. If the problem is sin, which is a lack of conformity to the will of God, to the law of God, and the righteousness of God. If the problem is sin that has arisen from a depraved and wicked heart, and if God is a just judge, yet willing to be gracious in Christ's Son, then the cross means something totally different than what your liberal, lukewarm Christian neighbor would think it means. What is the design of the atonement. It is the removal of an offense so that a relationship may be restored. If your child sins against you, <clears throat> things aren't good between mom and daughter or mom and son or father, right? When the offense is removed, the relationship is restored. The design of the atonement provided at the cross is the removal of an offense so the relationship may be restored between God and his children, the creator and the creature. There can be no reconciliation between God and man without atonement. God cannot forgive our sins without atoning for our sins being provided in Christ. So, just to race ahead, the gospel, Jesus dies on the cross for sinners. Whoever believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of their sin. What is atonement? Atonement's what happened at the gospel, at, at the cross. Jesus was removing the offense. He was removing the curse. He was removing the sin so that the relationship can be restored. 
Let's look at some features of the atonement. <coughs> Excuse me. The first feature that I want to focus on, and I'm not really going to be <coughs> tying into the Belgic Confession, but a lot of the scriptures we're looking at are referenced here. The first feature is it's a blood atonement. And you might even put here in parentheses, <coughs> as I did, or afterwards at least, it's a blood atonement. It's a sacrifice of a human life for sin. The sacrifice of a human life for sin. Our sins are dealt with. Remember atonement, the removing of an offense. Our sins are dealt with through the sacrifice of a human life. If there was no sacrifice going on at the cross, <clears throat> then God would have been murdering his son. Put it to you the other way, because sometimes um, atheists and agnostics will say, how is that not child you know, murder? How is that not murder? If there was no sacrifice, it would have been murder. But it wasn't murder. The nature of the death was voluntary. The reason for the death was to satisfy justice, making it a sacrifice rather than murder. Christ comes as a willing victim, one who is unjustly condemned. He comes of his own accord according to his own will, not by any outward compulsion, to offer his life to satisfy the just demands of God's law qualifies it to be a sacrifice rather than murder. Let's look at how the Bible will tell us that what happened at the cross was a sacrifice and not murder. We could say it was murder in the sense that the Pharisees murdered him, but the Father wasn't murdering him. The Father was sacrificing him. It is seen in the references to Kim throughout the Bible to be a sacrificial lamb, John the Baptist, his herald and forerunner, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That Lamb reference means Passover, sacrificial Lamb. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed. So we look at the cross and we can hear all the clamor of the, of the crowd and all the mockery and the jeering and we see all that, but we want to just kind of plug our ears to that and we look at the cross again and we see the father like Abraham laying his son Isaac on the altar to sacrifice him. That the father is sacrificing his son to remove an offense, not his son's offense, but our offense. The sacrifice element is seen furthermore in the references to him throughout the Bible as a high priest. What do priests do? They make sacrifices. That's their job. He was a sacrifice not from the order of Levi, but Melchizedek, the superior order. And unlike Melchizedek offering the sacrifice of a lamb or a goat or a bull, he offered the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews is replete with these references like Hebrews 7 he has no need, like those priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. So we see here the father offering his son, and we see the son just climbing up onto the altar and letting his hands be bound to sacrifice himself. Hebrews 9, but as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 10, which we read last week, <clears throat> just a few verses from that. When Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. And by that will, the will of God, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ for all. He was a sacrifice for sins. What happened at the cross? A sacrifice was made. A sweet aroma, a fragrance to God. It is seen in the references to him as a priest and the references to him as a lamb 
It's also seen in the references to the shedding of blood, and that's why I have 3.1, blood. Leviticus chapter 17, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Hebrews or Leviticus 17, verse 11, critical verse. Blood. Why blood? Why blood? Well, Leviticus explains, because life is in the blood. If you lose all your blood, you're dead. Remember what we saw last week, Lex Talionis. Life for life. For there to be atonement, the removal of an offense, a life needs to be taken. Blood needs to be shed. And so the, Levitic, the, the Israelites even had in their, their ceremonial calendar, they had one day of the year that was called the Day of Atonement. Not the Passover feast, different holiday. Day of Atonement. They needed the offense to be removed. Blood needed to be shed. And then this gives you goosebumps. When the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he lifted up the cup on the table. He's celebrating Passover. And he says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Christ is saying, my blood will be poured out tomorrow for atonement. It will be the day of atonement. And so we have throughout the Bible all these kinds of verses about blood, blood, blood. Care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Jesus says that uh, people need to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Ephesians 1, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. Colossians 1, through him to reconcile to him all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Hebrews chapter 9, by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. How much more will the blood of Christ? Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. I love Peter. <clears throat> knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Or how John begins Revelation chapter 1, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins with his blood. Blood atonement. Blood, the life is shed. The life is given. The blood is shed. There is forgiveness. And his life is taken. He removes the offense. If you're ever witnessing to Mormons, just read a fun book last week, Diamond Field Jack. You all know Diamond Field Jack up there? It's not a campground. It's actually a man. <laughs> Campground's named after him. Um, he was quite this infamous character. He was arraigned on the charge of murdering two sheep herders just here in the south. Fascinating story. Um, wrongly imprisoned, and for six years he's in jail. And they know he's innocent. The guys who actually killed the two men are actually um, confessed to it. But the two sheep herders who got killed happen to be uh, Mormons. And so the Mormons want blood. And the jury's filled up with Mormons. And they even say, we don't care if he didn't even kill these guys. We need blood atonement. When you talk to Mormons, they talk about blood atonement. You talk about blood being shed. You say, that's been done once and for all. There's no more need for more blood to be shed. So a good segue with them is to impress upon them that the lamb's blood is sufficient to remove the offense. We have here blood atonement. We have 3.2 propitiatory atonement. I see we're going to have to pick this up later on, but we'll just see if we can tackle this one. Propitiation is a big word, but what it means is to appease wrath. And the idea here is that God is angry. 
Psalm chapter 5, the Lord is, is angry with the wicked. And so liberal theologians, they had a big problem with this because they do not like to think of God as being angry or being filled with wrath. And so they don't like the thought of, a, of propitiation. Um, but listen to the scriptures. Romans 3 are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Hebrews 2 verse 17 Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. 1 John 2, he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 4, 10, and this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The idea here is this, as you look at the gospel, what we're seeing, as we look at the cross, what we're seeing is God is angry. He is angry against us for our sin because we have offended him. We have rebelled against him. We have been stubborn and stiff-necked and rebellious. And we have depraved hearts and we're born in this world with a heart that's full of original sin. We stand condemned before the tribunal of God's justice. And if God is a holy God and if God is a just God, then he must be angry against us. But instead of pouring out the vials of divine wrath on us, he poured them out on his son. That's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's why he told the disciples that he would take up the cup of suffering, the cup of God's wrath. Because the father was angry with his son because all our sins were put on him. But what happens when the Father's wrath is appeased? He has love for you. Love. Isaac Watts. See from his hands to his side and feet. Sorrow and love low mingled down. Propitiation. Liberal Christians don't like it. But real Christians love it. The Father's wrath is satisfied. And he's not angry with us. He was angry with his son and poured out all his anger on him. He plunged his son into the depths of hell to satisfy his just wrath. What a cross! What a cross. Expiatory sacrifice as well. We'll just finish with this. I think the kids will be up in a second. Expiation is another big word. Propitiation means to satisfy wrath or to, sorry, to appease wrath. Expiation means to make satisfaction. So, see, propitiation is looking at God as the subject. We want to satisfy his wrath. We want to appease it. Expiation looks at the sinner and it looks at his sin. That sin needs to be covered. That sin needs to be uh, removed. So expiation means the removal of guilt. And uh, it speaks about the satisfaction of justice, the satisfaction of the law. So think of Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So the law curses us because of our sin. So expiation says at the cross, the sin is being removed. The guilt is being removed. Well, the wages of sin is death. So that death is being met in Christ and the wages are being paid. The debt is being paid. Expiation, propitiation, appeasing God's wrath. Expiation, satisfying the just demands of the law. The law says you're cursed. The law says you need to die. The law says you're guilty. And at the cross, Christ satisfies the law. He says, okay, I heard you. I heard you. I'm cursed. I'm damned. I'm guilty. I bear it. 
So blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. The leper said to Jesus, kneeling before him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. So see, brothers and sisters, this is so beautiful. Know the cross. It is the richest thing that you could ever be meditating on. It's, it's wonderful for a child, and theologians write volumes on it, and we will spend eternity contemplating it. But he shed his blood. He gave up his life to appease his father's just wrath and to expiate and remove your guilt, to take away your sin, to pay down your debt so that you're perfect. This is expiation. Substitution. <clears throat> this is another important, important point, and it's for our great comfort that at the cross, he takes our place. He stands in our spot. Remember Lex Talionis? Life for a life, an eye for an eye. Listen to these verses here from 1 Peter. Um, or uh, 2 Corinthians 5. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I think I'm just going to wrap this up. We can go on next week. But as you think of substitution, think of a substitute teacher. Your teacher's sick and the substitute comes in. They take their place. That's what happens at the cross. It's substitution. Boys and girls, as you just came upstairs, you think about the cross. How many crosses were there on Golgotha? Do you remember? There were three, right? Now I want you to look at those three crosses in your mind. And I want you to say to yourself, that cross in the middle, that was mine. My name's written on it. Why is he there? He didn't do anything wrong. And Jesus is your substitute. He says, no, you sit this one out. I got this one. And you see, as we think about substitute, we think also of another related word, which I have in parentheses, representative atonement. You think about a substitute on the, you're playing basketball, and you're tired, and you go out, and another guy runs on the court. It's a substitute, but it's not really a substitute. You played your game, now he plays. You had your five minutes, now he has his five minutes. But at the cross, it's, it's more than substitution. It's representation. So, so he does it at the cross in your name. He does it at the cross for your sake. That's representation. See, so brothers and sisters, you and I can say with a straight face, I was crucified for my sins in my representative. What he did, I did. My sins have been paid for. I actually didn't pay it myself. He did. He was my representative. But you see, we're united. And when he did it, it's as good as if I had done it. Because he's my representative. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Christ died for the ungodly. You see, there's the representation. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What happened at the cross? Blood was shed. A life was given. Satisfying and appeasing God's wrath. Satisfying the just demands of the law. Removing your guilt. Removing your sin. Removing your blemish. Removing it all. Paying your debts. Substituting him for you as your representative. That's good news. That's the gospel. Your sin has not been swept under the rug. Your sin has not been shrugged off or minimized. Your sin has not been put on the shelf somewhere to be later recorded and pulled back and dusted off. 
It has been paid for. And God looks at every believing sinner and is reconciled, reconciled toward him and loves him as his very own child. The passionate fisherman turned apostle poignantly put it like this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Amen. Let us pray. Father,